Welcome, everyone, to the Becoming Engaged podcast, where we explore faith, life, and everything in between. I'm Natalia, Cheryl's virtual assistant, and we're thrilled to have you join us today. We're currently delving into an exciting series entitled, The Story, The Bible as One Continuing Story of God and His People. It's a journey through the Bible, discovering how each part contributes to the incredible narrative of God's relationship with humanity. If you're joining us on Facebook, don't forget to like and share this episode with friends and family. And for our YouTube listeners, make sure to hit that like button to support the podcast. Your engagement helps us reach more people and grow our community. Now grab your Bible, find a comfortable spot, and let's dig into the Word together. We believe that every page, every verse, brings us closer to understanding the vastness of God's love and plan. So let's embark on this journey and uncover the richness of the Bible, one story at a time. Thank you for being here, and let's get started. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Happy, happy Tuesday. I pray that everybody is having a marvelous, marvelous day, and welcome to the Beak Podcast with me, Coach Cheryl. So excited to have you in our live Bible studies that we do every Tuesday here at 7 p.m. Um, thank you for joining. I appreciate it as we jump in the Word together. Um, I'm going to ask you to do what we always ask you to do, and that is to like and share. If you're on Facebook, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and share. If you are watching via YouTube, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and like that post. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe so that you'll get the notifications that when we come on live. Hey, Lady Armstrong, thanks so much for joining. I am so glad that you all are here. I have been enjoying, I mean, thoroughly enjoying our sessions together as we are learning more about the word of God and how to apply it to our lives, how to take it um, and get the meat out of it and understand how we can actually live it. And so on today, we are diving back into our study. It's a 31 week study and we are in week 16 of this study. So yes, we've been going a long time and if you're just joining us for the first time, either live or on the replay, you want to make sure to go back to all of the other lessons. We're going from the beginning to the end of the text, the beginning and the end of the entire Bible, digging out the truths of it. So be sure to watch the other 15 episodes if you haven't already. So um, we're going to jump into on tonight. Hey, Val, thanks so much for joining we're going to jump into our topic on tonight, um, which is um, we've been walking through the children of Israel and their perplexities, which are our perplexities, if we are honest with ourselves. And so our title is The Beginning of the End. Doesn't that sound like ominous, like some a horror flick or some apocalyptic kind of movie? But it's the beginning of the end are of the kingdom of Israel. And so we're going to be walking through that, um, how they went from this glorious um, family to this kingdom that God rescued from the hands of the Egyptians, took them through miracles throughout the, um, throughout their valley um, experiences um, when they were in the wilderness, performing miracle after miracle, giving them, um, victory over their enemies in conquering their promised land and then how they walked right into apostasy just that quickly forgot the Lord and now we're going to see the downfall of that kingdom and what that looked like and the prophets that spoke to them during that time and the kings although very few that were good in that season so I'm so excited about jumping into the lesson. And I know sometimes it's easy for us to be critical. It's easy for us to say, oh man, those Israelites, oh, how could they? But then when we look at the current state of our world today, does anybody see any, um, <laughs> any parallels when we look at the landscape, when we watch the news, whether it is locally, whether it is regionally, whether it is nationally, whether it is internationally turmoil is everywhere and we look like the Israelites on so many fronts and even in our own personal lives I don't know about you but sometimes 
I see a little Israelite in me <laughs> um, where I um, don't always believe or receive um, the word of the Lord, um, even though he's come through for me so many times. If I'm by myself or if anybody else has ever felt like that, let me know in the comments. Um, let me know I'm not alone, that you have a, a little Israelite in you too. <laughs> but um, let's go ahead. Um, as always, we will jump into our trivia and then we'll jump into our lesson for tonight. So if y'all are ready for trivia, say ready in the comments and we will jump into this trivia. All right. Let's dive in. Let's see. I don't see any ready in the comments. Y'all ready for trivia? Y'all ready? Y'all know this, uh, this history lesson we're about to embark on let me know in the comments and we're going to dive in into our first trivia question thank you lady armstrong for letting me know let me not feel like i'm all alone i'm, I'm not by myself <laughs> and thank you that bass says we are ready let's hit this trivia let's get it going all right so let's jump into our trivia lesson um our trivia questions our first question says and this is King says, how did Hezekiah respond when the Assyrians threatened to attack him? Was it A, he assembled all the fighting men of Israel over the age of 20? Is it B, he went up to the temple of the Lord to pray? Is it C, he sent word to the king of Cush to come to their aid? Or is it D, he made a peace treaty with King and y'all, I'm going to pronounce this the way I've heard it. So maybe it's right and maybe it's wrong. Sennacherib. If y'all know if it's different, let me know. Help a sister out <laughs> to spare his people. So let me know if it's A, B, C, or D. Did he assemble all the fighting men over 20 for A? Was it B, he went up to the temple to pray? Was it C, he sent word to the king of Cush to come to their aid? Or D, he made a peace treaty with King Sennacherib to spare his people. Let me know what you think it is in the comments. And I see Val says she thinks it is B. All right, so let's go on over to question number two. Trivia question number two says, what was Isaiah's response when he had a vision of the Lord seated on a throne? Was it A, Great, he said, great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. Was it B? He said nothing. And he got on his face in worship before the Lord. Was it C? He said, woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. Or was it D? He tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. A, B, C, or a D? Hey, Lady Sharon, thanks so much for joining. Put those answers in the comments. We're going to you know, after the video, we're going to see how well we all did. <laughs> and especially if it's been a long time since you have gone through this part of the Bible, sometimes it gets a little fuzzy. <laughs> like, I think it's this one. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> all right. So y'all drop those answers in for question number two. What was Isaiah's response when he had a vision of the Lord seated on the throne? A, B, C, or D. All right, so let's go to question number three. Question number three is, what were the prophetic words Isaiah spoke to Israel? Was it A, the Lord will have compassion on you and settle you in your own land. B, destruction is around the corner and you will be sent in exile to Egypt. C, these are days of freedom and prosperity but trouble is on the horizon or D all of the above. What were those prophetic words that Isaiah spoke to Israel? Was it a B C or D go ahead and drop those answers in the comments. This is interesting. This is going to be a great, great lesson on today. All right, so let's roll on to our final trivia question. I see your answers coming in. Let's go on to our final trivia question, question number four. And that is, 
What are the words Isaiah speaks about a coming Messiah? Was it A, he was like a lamb, led, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter? Is it B, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him? Is it C, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all? Or D, all of the above? All right, I, I see your answers. Come on in. Okay, for question two. Okay, awesome, awesome. So what are the words Isaiah spoke about a coming Messiah? A, he was led like a <laughs> led like a lamb to the slaughter. B, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. C, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Or D, all of the above. All right, I see everybody ringing in with answer D for that particular one. All righty, so we will... Um, see what the answer is right after we come back from our video lesson. So I'm going to queue up the video lesson, be attentive so that you can hear what goes on it and you'll hear all the answers that come through that. Hey, Yvonne, how are you? Thank you so much for joining. Good to have you with us on tonight. Y'all, y'all better come on in with these answers. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. So we're going to queue the video lesson and then we're going to come back with the answers from our trivia. This is your story. This is my story. But most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Back one morning in January of 2009, I got up, got some coffee, and turned on the television. It was on the Today Show. They were doing a special on George Washington on the same week newly elected President Obama took oath of office. What I didn't know is that George Washington was initially offered by his soldiers to become the first king of America, but he turned it down. The commentator pondered the question, what if he accepted? And with the help of the internet, they traced down all of George's 8,000 descendants to see who would be sitting on the throne of America today. Well, climbing the proverbial family tree took them to the city of San Antonio, Texas, where I live. The television screens panned into a local Burger King, and there was Paul Washington asking for his order to be king-sized. If George Washington had said yes to the offer of monarchy, Paul would be our ninth king. Then up on the screen appeared his son Dick and then his son Connor. They would have respectively succeeded Paul. Dick and Connor attend the Oak Hills Church where I minister and Connor is good friends with my sons and has spent many nights over my house. And, and, and every time he came over, he never mentioned this small detail. I have to tell you, if this were my story, it'd be the first thing you know about me. 
Hello, my name is Randy Washington, and I'm a direct descendant of George Washington. Here, kiss my ring. <laughs> As I chatted with the family on why their Uncle George passed on the offer, they knew the answer. George Washington refused to become the king during a time when the Revolutionary War motto was, no king but King Jesus. I took this quote from the Catholic Education website. In a 1774 report to King George, the governor of Boston noted, if you ask an American who is his master, he will tell you he has none, nor any governor but Jesus Christ. The pre-war colonial committees of correspondence soon made this American motto, no king but King Jesus. And this sentiment was carried over in, into the 1783 peace treaty with Great Britain, ending that war which begins in the name of the most holy and undivided Trinity. As we turn our attention to our story today on the nation of Israel, whose kings have gotten them into a heap of trouble, you wonder had the children of Israel held to a model like no king but God, which is what God wanted, would we be reading a much different outcome to their story? I think we would have. We have learned in the previous weeks that due to the actions of King Solomon, the strong, vibrant nation of Israel is divided into two. Ten of the twelve tribes form the nation of Israel to the north, and the remaining two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, form the nation of Judah to the south. Between the two smaller, now weaker nations, there are 38 kings in all. Only five of them are good and follow the Lord. The other 33, quote unquote, do evil in the eyes of the Lord. We saw last week that God raised up prophets in both the north and the southern kingdoms to try to warn them, to get them back on track, but nothing seemed to work for very long. Last week we looked at the northern kingdom of Israel and how for 208 years God's prophets spoke God's pure message of truth and love, inviting them to return, but their words fell on deaf ears. As we turn to the opening chapter of 16, it's now the year 209, and we find it's the beginning of the end. Here's what the story says. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, but they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors, who did not trust in the Lord their God. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Assyria, and there they still are. God raises up a pagan nation called the Assyrians to overtake them and deport them to Assyria. These ten tribes never reassemble again. They just blend into the pagan landscape. They are called the lost tribes of Israel. Listen to the strong words of God. The Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left. The story makes a sudden shift down south and we receive a breath of fresh air. The king in the south at the time of Israel's capture is King Hezekiah and he happens to be one of the five good kings we mentioned. The story tells us that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and that the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. Now the arrogant king of Assyria decides he's coming after Judah next. But Hezekiah stands up to him. I love that. The king of Assyria says to him, On what are you basing this confidence of yours? Now that's a good question even for us today. The king of Assyria tries to intimidate him, to scare him, and to undermine his leadership with his people. He said to them, Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord. What does Hezekiah do? Does he back down? No. Does he sharpen his sword? No. He put on his knee pads and prayed. He asked God to give them success. And God says back to him through one of the main prophets in the south, Isaiah, God wanted me to tell you that he's got your back. Now listen to this. On one particular night, God enters into the Assyrian camp and took out 185,000 soldiers. The next morning when the king of Assyria found out what happened, it simply says that he broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh 
and he stayed there. But King Hezekiah, he dies after reigning for God for 29 years and his son Manasseh takes over. And we're told in the story, Manasseh returned Judah to evil. God comes to his prophet Isaiah and tells him to give Judah a message. God tells him that he has made a decision. He is raising up another pagan nation called the Babylonians who will come and do to them what the Assyrians did to the northern kingdom, capture them, destroy their city, and deport them to Babylon. Now, if you've been following the story from chapter 2, this presents a real problem. It's one thing for this to happen to the northern tribes, but not Judah. God made a promise to King David about 400 years earlier that he would establish his throne forever, that the Messiah, the Anointed One, would come from David's tribe, from Judah. If Judah goes away, not only do we not have a Messiah, but God has broken his promise. Isaiah comes back to Judah and says, and I paraphrase, God is not going to have you stay in Babylon forever like he did with the northern kingdom. After a period of time, he's going to bring you back home. Not because you deserve it. You are so evil. He is doing it to keep his promise. God gives his purpose for all of this, both the exile and the return home, through the lips of the prophet Isaiah. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Then the whole human race will know that I, the Lord, am Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. You see what he's talking about here, don't you? Or better, you see who he's talking about. If you don't, Isaiah makes it pretty clear. 700 years before Jesus' birth from Mary and Joseph, from the tribe of Judah, Isaiah talks about him. Let me read him to you. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like the root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we were healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now that's a savior. That's a redeemer. You know, there's so much to take from this story to help us in our own stories, but I'd like to go back to that motto, no king but King Jesus. We see over and over again in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, that when we put God on the throne of our lives, we put ourselves in the best possible position for success. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You put God first and follow Him, you will find that He'll throw everything else in. I don't know about you, but for me, no king but King Jesus. hear me okay I don't know why I was muted I'm so sorry I'm just going off to <laughs> no king but King Jesus to me that was just so powerful um and I think it's something that we should be thinking about as well 
And can y'all tell me if y'all can hear me? I can see them. Y'all said it has no sound. Can y'all not hear me? Oh, you, you can hear me now? Okay. All righty. I don't know what happened there after I guess I came off the video. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. I'm talking about no king, but King Jesus. I'm going to throw um, Valerie's comment up there so you can see what I'm talking about. No king, but King Jesus, that we would put him first above any political affiliation, above any other ideology, that King Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings would be on our hearts and on our minds, that we would be more kingdom focused than we are governmentally focused that he would rule every aspect of our lives, that he would drive our decisions, that he would drive our theology, that he would drive every area of our lives. I love that. No king, but King Jesus. That should be all of our ideals is to represent him well and to make everything reflective of that. And so let's jump back into our tribute. Um, I hope you all are ready. We're going to go through the answers for that. So let me pull that up really quick. Our first question was, how did Hezekiah respond when the Assyrians threatened to attack him? Was it A, B, C, or D? And I know we had a couple different um, answers to that. And I saw um, Elder Sharon where you said that you were a little confused about the order of the questions. And so if you want to go ahead and drop those answers in now that you could see the order. Um, how did Hezekiah respond when the Assyrians threatened to attack him? And the answer to this one is B. He went up to the temple of the Lord to pray. If you got the answers right, go ahead and drop a thumbs up in the comments. If you all can remember, um, that the king of Assyria was taunting him, saying to him, who do you think you are? We're going to do to you just like we did to Israel. We are going to come and we're going to take you and we're going to um, banish you from your land. And so remember the tribes of Israel, they um, were 10 tribes from the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah was only two tribes. So they were a smaller nation. And here it is, the Assyrians taunting them, saying, well, who do you think you are? When we took Israel away, what do you think we're going to do to you? And so what did King Hezekiah do? One of the only, one of five kings out of 38 kings that were good, he did what any good God-fearing person would do under a threat is he went to pray. He sought the Lord who is his helper. And when we hear about how God helped them, um, the Bible tells us that they didn't even have to fight. While they were sleeping at night, the Lord snuck in on them and killed 185,000 of them without them ever having to lift a finger. So put a pin in that. That's going to be one of our reflections. But let's go on to question two that says, what was Israel's response? Excuse me, Isaiah's response when he had a vision of the Lord seated on the throne, was it A, B, C, or D? Did he say great is the Lord and worthy to be praised? Did he say nothing and just got on his face and worship? Or did he say, woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips? Or did he tear his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes? And the answer to this one was C. He said, woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips and that's when the angel came and took that um um stone of fire stuff stone from the fire and touched his lips with it okay I, I was about to go deep into that but we're just gonna leave it there if you got um that one right go ahead and drop a thumbs up i see thumbs up and i see um elder sharon b for one all right i see you so let's go on to question number three Let's jump to the question for that. And it says, what were the prophetic words spoken? Isaiah spoke to Israel. Was it A, the Lord will have compassion on you and settle you in your own land? Was it B, destruction is around the corner and you will be sent into exile in Egypt? Was it C, these are days of freedom and prosperity, but trouble is on the horizon? Or was it D, 
all of the above. And the answer for this one is A. The Lord will have compassion on you and settle you in your own land. That even though they were going to be exiled by the Babylonians, that God was going to bring them back to Israel and settle them back. He is going to have compassion on you because he had spoke a word to David saying that your throne will forever be in Judah, that your throne would forever be existed and that the Messiah would come through you. And so despite Israel's wickedness, God's word was stronger than their sin. Now that'll preach right there. God's word, he is true to his word. And despite our shortcomings, he is going to honor what he said. All right. So that's the answer to question number three. And so let's jump down to question number four. Our last trivia question says, what are the words Isaiah speaks about a coming Messiah? Was it A, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter? Was it B, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him? Or C, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all? Or D, all of the above? And the answer to this question is D, all of the above. And so if you um, got those last two right, I forgot to say it for number three. If you got those last two right, go ahead and do those thumbs up in the comments. So we'll know that you got those right as well. All right, I'm loving the thumbs up, loving the thumbs up. Oh, Sharon, she said she missed answering question number three. What was question number three? Let me see. Hold on. Let me get it back for you so you can at least know what it is. That, oh, the prophetic words that Isaiah spoke to Israel. Um, the answer for that one was A, the Lord will have compassion on you and settle you in your own land. That was the answer for number three. And we just finished number four and number four was all of the above. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him as he was on the cross. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was the perfect lamb, the perfect substitute for us so that we could have life. He, be, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. He did that for us, knowing that we were not able to do it ourselves. There was nothing good in us. There was nothing good about us. But because of his love for us, he did this. And so I am so thankful and so grateful to God for his mercy to us. Oh, you answered number four twice. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. But I love these lessons. Um, and I love going through these lessons because what I am learning is no matter how many times I read the Bible, I read the text or I study the text, I am always learning something new or I am being reminded of something that I forgot. So I love digging into the word of God because just like the, um, the Bible says that it is sharp and it is active. The word is alive and it's living. It's not just words on paper. It is the power to them that believe. And so I want to just um, ask you any reflections that you have, anything that stood out to you, any takeaways that you have from our lesson today. I want you to go ahead and drop those into the comments. I am going to just drop in a few takeaways that I got from um, this lesson. And one of the things that God is teaching me through um, going through the Bible and, and reading it again and, and gleaning from it and meditating on it is the power of God. I think sometimes in my life, and I'm going to talk about this personally, is that I forget the power of God. Um, when I am, when I come up against, you know, circumstances that, you know, go on in my life and, or, or I come up against um, what I think are trials and tribulation and what I see are, are things that may not be going my way. The Bible calls them light afflictions that are but for a moment. 
Sometimes I am dumbfounded. Sometimes I'm afraid and I'm fearful and I don't know what to do. But when I think about who God is, the Bible just reminds me of how powerful he is. And when I think about how the king of Assyria came to King Hezekiah and just taunting him and taunting the people saying, you know, I'm going to do to you just what I did, you know, to the Northern kingdom. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make this a wasteland. I'm going to drive you off and make you slaves and make you subject to me. But how just a prayer from the king and an affirmation from the prophet of the Lord just revealed to the king that, oh no, <laughs> this will not be so. The king of Assyria will not do anything to you while you are resting in your homes. I will attack him and I will kill him without you having to do anything. So some of the times that gives me assurance to know that all the battles that I think I have to fight, I now know I don't have to fight them. The battle is the Lord's that I can just rest in God. And when enemies come unprovoked from me to attack me, when the enemy comes against me, I can just say, Lord, I need you to lift up your standard against him because I've done nothing. I've said nothing. He is just coming to me and I can trust that God will fight for me without me having to do anything, without me having to go into battle. So that was really, really powerful and really stood out to me how God just smote them in the night. Like, okay, 185,000 of y'all are no more. <laughs> you are just gone. And how that just set a fire under the king of Assyria. Said, well, I probably should get out of here. I should probably leave them alone. And he troubled them no more. I guess if you lost almost 200,000 people in 24 hours, that would make you a little bit afraid and say, well, maybe the Lord is on their side. So I love that. Um, one of the um, things, and I think that sometimes, sometimes people underestimate the anointing of God and, and the power of God. And so I want you to, to take away that from this lesson that I will reserve my energy. I will reserve my headspace. I will reserve my thoughts to godly things. I won't give them to people or that taunt me. I won't give them to people that ask me, who do you think you are that you're doing such and such and such? I will reserve my energy to pray and to praise and to honor the Lord, knowing that he will vindicate me from any attack of the enemy. And the second thing, um, was God's faithfulness to his word, even when Israel was had run amok, <laughs> even when they were serving other gods, when they had um, decided that God wasn't the God that they wanted to serve, that he wasn't their king, how they let their kings lead them astray. And I keep saying leaders matter who you follow matters. Don't let anybody tell you, no, it doesn't matter who the leader is. It doesn't. Yes, it does. Leadership will always matter because as the leader goes, so do the people. And so we have to be careful when we think about that. But no matter what Israel did, God was faithful to his word, faithful to his word, that even though they were serving other gods, even though they forgot God, he didn't forget his word, not only to David to keep his line um, or his kingly line forever, but he was faithful to Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham. His word is a through line through the Bible. He said, I spoke this word and I won't let it fall. I promised the Messiah and he is going to come through that lineage of David. Even though that lineage may not have been faithful to me, I will be faithful to my word word. So the word that God spoken, it has spoken, it won't fall to the ground. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word stands forever. So when the enemy is taunting you and saying, oh, you made a mistake. God won't forget. Yes, he will forgive the word he has spoken of your life. He is faithful and just faithful and just faithful and just to perform it. Yes, Lord, help us not to underestimate 
your power. We trust your power. We believe in your power. And Lord, help remind us of your power when we um, feel weak, um, when we feel despondent, when we feel discouraged. Remind us of your great power. Amen. Yes, we can trust God's faithfulness as he prepares to manifest his plan to us. And sometimes it seems like it's taking a long time. I was just listening to a word. We're going through um, the story of Abraham and how he had to wait 10 years for the promised son. But God was faithful even through that process. So I don't know where you may be in your process. You feel like, you know, your best days are gone and and that the promise that God has spoken over your life, that you may never see it. If God spoke a word, I promise he is going to fulfill that word to you. So be of good cheer and be of good courage. God is going to, he's going to fulfill it. You will see it in your lifetime. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining me on tonight. If you haven't already shared this, I'm going to ask you to share this. Um, so that someone else can be blessed and empowered by the word. Um, Just a quick announcement before we jump off. Um, Last week, I mentioned that we're doing a special session called The Power of Sisterhood. I am bringing all my sisters on, and we're going to be doing that. We were supposed to be doing it tonight, but we had a few scheduling conflicts, so we moved it to this Thursday. Um, Those of you that are in the inner circle, meet me this Thursday on Zoom at 7.30. That's where we're going to be. And then we're going to come live at eight o'clock on Facebook and YouTube for the general audience. Um, They say membership has privileges. So our inner circle, we're going to be jumping on at 730 and then we'll invite um, everyone from the public to jump with us on at eight o'clock here on Facebook and on YouTube. So be sure to jump on. It's going to be powerful. I'm so excited. Um, that I was able to talk my sisters into joining with me. And so we're going to be talking all things family, all things what powerful sisterhood looks like. Thank you so much, um, Elder Sharon. I am glad that you enjoyed the lesson on tonight. I love you all with the love of the Lord. And I look forward to seeing you all Thursday night. If you can't make it Thursday night, then come back for our live Bible study on next Tuesday. God bless you all. Oh, hold up. Before we do, we have a new movement on tonight. And so I wanted to do the movement before um, we jump off tonight. And it simply says, everyone who comes into a relationship with God through faith in Christ belongs to the new community God is building called the church. The church is commissioned to be the presence of Christ in the lower story, telling his story by the way we live and the words we speak. Every story of the church points people to the second coming of Christ, when he will return to restore God's original vision. So we are living epistles read of men. Things we do, things we say, people are watching to see Christ in us. And so I pray that when they see me and that when they see you, they see Christ, the hope of glory. I look forward to seeing you all next week. God bless you. Welcome, brave women of faith, to a journey of transformation and empowerment. Discover the Becoming Engaged, Finding the Courage to Live series, a free four-part masterclass uniquely designed for Christian women ready to conquer fear, embrace their God-given purpose, and live life on purpose without apology. In this exclusive series, you'll unlock the keys to living a life filled with intention, joy, and unwavering faith. Explore God's profound plan for you. Delve deep into your spiritual journey and awaken to a life where every day is lived with divine purpose. Join a community of like-minded women stepping boldly into a life of courage and conviction. This is your moment to transform, to flourish, and to live unapologetically in God's grace. Embrace the life you were meant to lead. Sign up today and step into your power with God by your side. Sign up today at bit.ly forward slash becoming engaged masterclass. Hello, dear listeners. Thank you for tuning into the Becoming Engaged podcast. Your support means the world to us and helps keep this podcast thriving. If you enjoy our content and wish to contribute, we have three convenient ways for you to donate. The first one is Cash App. It's quick, 
easy and user-friendly, and perfect for instant support. The second way is Venmo. It's a simple and secure way to send your contribution. And number three, PayPal, for those who prefer a globally recognized platform. And donating is super easy. Just scan the QR code on your screen right now, and it will guide you to your preferred payment method. Every contribution, no matter the size, makes a significant impact. Thank you for your generosity and for being a part of our podcast family.